Racial profiling is a very serious and controversial issue, calling into question the rationality of our fears, balanced with the unfairness and unethicality of stereotyping others. Americans as a nation tend to overreact to perceived threats, or national tragedies, or scapegoats to economic or national security, or people who practice a lifestyle that goes against their religious upbringing. I'm not judging. People are naturally afraid of terrorists like Al-Qaeda, or catching the gayness, or illegal immigrants, or the Jews. I'm afraid of monkeys gaining sentience or becoming carriers of a global outbreak of rage virus. And the gayness! And take it from me, many of those fears are just plain stupid and irrational. For instance, I myself was a victim of profiling for many years, feared and ostracized by my peers at school because I also belonged to a group of people well known for being dangerous psychopathic cultists who practice blood sacrifice and satanic rituals, a rotten core festering in the heart of religious conservative America. NERDS! The most dangerous enemy of all, infesting every strata of American society, not easily profiled by race or social class. Nerds could be anywhere, meeting in secret and practicing their black masses by playing the most evil, diabolical, unholy game ever created. No, not that one. I'm talking about Dungeons and Dragons, Satan's game. I used to play it all the time at lunch in high school, and the big rumor floating around about me was that I was a Satanist. And when most of my game books had demons on the cover and I was playing with magic cards that had pentagrams on them, well, it didn't really help my case. At one point, I actually got suspended for gambling, and they threatened to expel me if I ever brought my D&D books again, so me and the rest of the group had to play in secret. The other rumor going on about me was that I was gay because I was in drama club, so I was a gay Satanist. I was just positively evil. It was stupid. I mean, laughably stupid. The entire basis for the satanic cult fears was based on a wildly inflammatory and completely inaccurate media frenzy about the disappearance of a college student in 1979. It had nothing to do with Dungeons and Dragons whatsoever. The kid had run away from home and eventually committed suicide, and I promise you, it sure as hell wasn't over his half-elf ranger dying in the Temple of Elemental Evil. There were also a bunch of hilarious, religiously paranoid comic strips created by Jack Chick that portrayed role-playing games as gateways to the occult, witch covens, and deviant orgiastic practices. Almost immediately after the student's disappearance, an author named Rona Jaffe wrote a novel based on the incident, and for some insane reason, that novel was turned into a TV movie called Mazes and Monsters, exploiting people's fears of Dungeons and Dragons and role-playing games. Even my mother was afraid I'd fallen in with a satanic cult when she saw me reading the books. But then she met my friends that I gamed with and finally realized just how silly this whole thing really is. It's the same reason that Mazes and Monsters is one of the goofiest, least credible suspense movies ever made. And that's because people who play Dungeons and Dragons look like this! Just look at them! They're the least threatening people imaginable aside from Walmart greeters and the Snuggles Bear! They're just nerds! The most violent nerds ever get is when you disagree with them on who the best host of Mystery Science Theater was. They don't memorize scripture from the Satanic Bible, they memorize fucking Monty Python movies. And if you think these fears are old-fashioned, I got two words for you: Harry fucking Potter and fears he promotes witchcraft. How joyless and paranoid is your life if you're afraid of children and geeks armed with funny-shaped dice who still play with dolls? And all this media frenzy and paranoia finally culminated in the made-for-TV movie Mazes and Monsters, starring Tom Hanks in his first major leading role. The DVD artwork makes this movie look kick-ass, man. Even though this is a stock photo of Tom taken about 15 years after the movie was made and, you know, there aren't actually any enormous labyrinths, evil castles, or dragons in this movie, uh, 
Okay, I guess basically the whole cover's a lie. But come on! Occultism! D&D style ritual murders! Evil nerds! Let's roll them bones and watch some mazes and monsters! Oh wait, sorry. No, um, this is the opening to Police Squad. <laughs> Look, we heard a game of mazes and monsters got a little out of hand over at the university. Seconds, bud. Oh my god, what? A mazes and monsters game got out of hand? Call the National Guard! Elevate the terror level! Mazes and monsters? Right. You know how to play it? My kids play it. I know yeah, the game. Well. Yeah, well, you know these damn kids with their hobbits and their rings of power. You think this mazes and monsters game got out of hand? You should have seen it when 3rd edition came out. At nights, I can still smell the bodies in the streets. This is Bud Hayden, live from Pequod Campus, where I'll be reporting on the apparent disappearance of a Grant University student, the victim of a seemingly innocent game, Mazes and Monsters. So explain to me how exactly a game victimizes and kidnaps a college student. No, never mind the rampant drug and alcohol abuse on college campuses. This game is on the loose, brainwashing and victimizing these poor, innocent, helpless 20-year-olds. Now, Mazes and Monsters is a fantasy role-playing game in which the players create an imaginary character. These characters are then plunged into a fantasy world of invented terrors. <laughs> That's just our Greyhawk game on Saturdays. You want to see real terrors, you should join our Call of Cthulhu game on Wednesdays. The point of the game is to amass a fortune without being killed. Well, as long as we're making broad generalizations here, isn't amassing a fortune without getting killed part of the point of real life, too? It's kind of a psychodrama, you might say, where these people deal with problems in their lives by acting them out. Oh my god, people finding a healthy outlet to deal with their real-life problems? Those evil bastards should be rounded up and drowned in ammonia! Then we are introduced one by one to the gaming group six months before the disaster, starting with JJ, a 16-year-old boy genius who's about to head off to college. And if you're wondering why he happens to be wearing a Germanic army helmet with a chrome spike on top, get used to disappointment, because this is never explained. Already, I have to wonder if it's the Mazes and Monsters players we really have to worry about, since JJ's mom is clearly a raving lunatic who obsessively and disturbingly redecorates JJ's bedroom on a random basis. Check out this horror show! What have you done? It looks like a hospital! No, it looks like a hospital bathroom, or the inside of a C's candy store. I can tell you don't like it. Don't like it? I hate it! Do you know how many of my clients would give their eye teeth for a Julia Brockway room like this? Why, just last week, Jennifer Lopez asked me to do her entire dressing room like this. Then we meet Kate, who appears to be in the middle of shooting a douche commercial with her mom. Mom, when Dad left us, were you ever sorry you married him in the first place? Do you ever feel, you know, not so fresh? Sure. That's why I douche, but only with natural ingredients. So Noreen is boring, huh? <laughs> boring is the nicest thing I can say about Chlorine. Kate, she is your father's wife now. No, you are my father's wife. <sighs> when Dad left us, were you ever sorry you married him in the first place? For about one minute. But I was really angry. Listen, we had some very happy years together. Life is risk. Yeah, but... I don't know, the guys at school are such chauvinists, I can't be myself with them. You know, you have to pretend to be dumb because bright girls scare them. Feelings scare them. Oh, I'm sorry, I kind of lost interest in your boring-ass talkie scene, so I started playing some Bayonetta. Are there titties in this movie? Uh, no, there are. Mary Sue here wants to be a writer, but feels she needs to pick up some more life experience before she can start the next great American novel. I've got writer's block, but I've finally figured out why. It's because I haven't really lived yet, so how can I write about things I don't know about? That's never stopped Stephanie Meyer or Ann Coulter. We also meet Daniel, a guy who looks and dresses exactly like Fred from Scooby-Doo. He also comes from a white privileged family who doesn't like his decision to go to Grant University instead of prestigious MIT. He wants to design games instead. Just give me a little more time, okay? Daniel, this is a very competitive world and you're gonna have to live in it. Now! Not later, but now! Later, you're not gonna be able to find a job. 
Later, they're going to want the computer expert from MIT, not a game player from that Grant University. And much later, the Indians and Chinese are going to radically underbid domestic companies for software contracts. So go to MIT now while you still can, because God knows by the year 2000, your computer science degree will be fucking useless, and you'll be stuck at home trapped forever in a hopeless fucking purgatory with a fucking blue robot reviewing shitty movies and horrible Final Fantasy games, and I can't stand it anymore! What the fuck has become of my life?! I'm gonna burn this whole fucking place to the ground! Ah! All I know is to take my medicine, I always take my medicine And I feel fantastic, and I never felt as good as how I do right now Except for maybe when I... JJ meets up with Kate at Grant University, where they talk about how they need to find a fourth player for their gaming group. We've got to find a fourth player. Right, someone who doesn't flunk out or freak out. And yes, JJ is wearing an enormous and stupid cowboy hat. Really? Is that gonna be his character thing? Wearing a new stupid hat in every scene? Because I can do that. It's not that funny. Anyway, JJ posts a sign looking for a new player on the cafeteria bulletin board. But interestingly, the sign doesn't have any form of contact information on it. Instead, JJ lurks nearby, watching the board like a hunter. When Robbie, played by Tom Hanks here, stops to read the flyer, JJ pounces in a matter of seconds. Hi, I'm JJ Brockway. So, they don't want anyone crazy in their group, but JJ's been staking out the bulletin board for days, wearing a World War I aviator's helmet and goggles, just waiting for someone to take a passing interest in their flyer. Dude, just have a little tear-off strip with your phone number on it, asshole. JJ invites Robbie to a Bridget Bardot-themed party. Uh, don't ask, because seriously, a hard hat? Now that just doesn't make any sense. Someone really has to call an intervention on this hat thing, because we're only 14 minutes into this movie and you're already pulling this on us? I uh, brought you something. Ah, uh, 1987, great year. You know, JJ should really be more impressed by this, since this scene is set in 1982, and a bottle of wine from 1987 would mean that Robbie brought it back from the future! Robbie also runs into Kate, and they start talking about mazes and monsters in that way non-nerd screenwriters think nerds talk about RPGs. <clears throat> I played a game called Mazes and Monsters a little too much. You're kidding. What level? Uh, ninth. Ninth level. So am I. Oh. Isn't it wonderful to be finally creating your own scenarios? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and your own fantasies, too. I'm really gonna miss it. Oh, Robbie, you poor bastard. You sound just like me when I was trying to quit amphetamines. See, for Robbie, this just isn't fair. Gamer girls today are relatively commonplace, but in 1982? Shit, finding a girl who could talk intelligently about Dungeons and Dragons was a statistical impossibility. It was like discovering penicillin by accident. So, if you were a nerdy guy and you actually had the chance to meet a gamer girl, it was like the holy grail. It was your one chance in ever to get laid. So, grades, D&D &D and sex... I am the maze controller. The god of this universe I have created. The absolute authority. Only I know the perilous course which you are about to take. Your fate is in my hands. Yeah, this guy's pretty good, but this is how you really run a game. I'm feeling brave tonight. How brave? Brave enough to do battle with hideous monsters? Hmm? I'm Glacia the Fighter, and I've won the mighty talking sword of Lothia. I am Freelich, the frenetic of Glossomere, the cleverest of all sprites. I am Pardieu, a holy man. In reaching the ninth level, I have acquired many magic spells and charms, the greatest of which is the Graven Eye of Timur. Yeah, this is what happens when someone who's never actually seen a D&D game in his life tries to write a movie about D&D. As you might predict, Kate and Robbie fall in love. So much in love that they even get a sappy frolicking montage. And this is the worst thing that could possibly happen in any D&D group, because there's nothing more annoying in an RPG than two players who are nailing each other on the side. It's just gross. They're always agreeing with each other and having sex. It just makes you want to kill yourself. You know that no Grant University student has ever committed suicide? What can I do? Maybe I should smash my motorbike into the dorm wall. Then J.J. starts planning ways to kill himself. I'm serious. He just spontaneously decides he wants to die despite never seeming the slightest bit depressed the whole movie up to this point. This is a pivotal scene in the film. It's gotta be the stuff that legends are made of. I want them to remember J.J. Brockway. But who will inherit his hat collection? 
This scene really bothers me. He's never seemed suicidal up to this point. And despite his crippling fashion sense, he somehow maintains a huge circle of friends that are all too happy to attend his ridiculous theme parties. It's not fair! I want out of this movie, too! The mysterious forbidden Peakwood Caverns. Boy genius suicides in caverns. They talk about it forever. I'd be immortal. And so, determined to gloriously kill himself by dying in a cave, he goes to Pequod Caverns, but suddenly, he's struck by a bolt of inspiration, an idea that will revolutionize role-playing games forever, intentionally sabotaging your Dungeon Master's whole campaign! However, between you and the evil undead is a deep pit, where at the very bottom you can see just a faint glitter. Freelick jumps into the pit to gather the treasure. How much does Freelick get? I love the look on the DM's face here. This is the classic Dungeon Master thousand mile stare of a hardened DM taken aback at just how fucked a player is, and realizing how boned the whole campaign's become in an instant. It's a trap. No. The pit is filled with sharp, gem encrusted spikes. Freelich, the fanatic of Glossomere, is impaled and dies. But man, who's the rich evil bastard who lines a pit trap with gem encrusted spikes? Now that's just showing off. Aw, oh, JJ, that was really stupid, jumping into the pit without using your sonar first. Really stupid. Why did you do that? Hey, cheer up, JJ. You can start again as a new character. Oh, it'll take him forever to gather power. Guys, weren't you listening? Gem-encrusted spikes, remember? Just go down there, pull his body off, and while you're down there, pry some gems off and pay for a resurrection. I'd like to propose a new game. Kind of an evolution of Maces and Monsters but we'd be playing at a much more sophisticated level. I propose we play mazes and monsters in a real setting. Pequod Caverns. And so LARPing was born. Dignity died shortly thereafter. You are entering the secret mazes of the evil Verations. His awesome wickedness is matched only by the greatness of his treasure. Shall ye enter? Aye! Aye! I yeah, I'm not feeling this one. You guys go have fun getting lost and dying, though. <laughs> ah, turn undead! Turn undead! Be careful. Could be a trick. Some skeletons possess mystical powers. You have two questions. Um, what do Jack's tattoos mean? No, stupid! Perhaps there's a clue hidden in the skull. Beware of the sacrilege. Beware of the sacrilege. Beware the humidity! The hell? Beware of the sacrilege! Okay, someone just duct tape a maglite into a skeleton's mouth. I think I can handle this. They start running around the condemned mine and, like any good adventuring party, split up to maximize their chances of falling down a precipice and being lost forever. That's when JJ starts rolling for random monster encounters. A monster! A monster! A monster! A Goraville! A Goraville! A Goraville! The fuck is that? The fuck is that? And then, without any foreshadowing or reason, Robbie sees the very same monster step out of the darkness to attack him. The others hear Robbie's pants fudging squeals of terror and rush to his aid, only to find there's nothing there. You okay, Robbie? Hey, Robbie. Alright, Robbie. It's alright. It's alright now. I have slain the Gorf. And lo. I have slain it without thy help, so verily I am bequeathed solo XPs. The most frightening monsters are the ones that exist in our minds. As if an eye had been blinked. As if some phantom force in the universe had made a move eons beyond our comprehension. Huh? There was no giant. The there was nothing in the tunnel but the puzzled men of courage who suddenly found themselves alone with shadows and darkness. Anyway, as you might have gathered by now, Robbie has mentally gone bye-bye. Bless you all. For some reason, the trip into the cave and encounter with the skeleton from JJ's anatomy class has him completely wigged out and thinking he's actually Pardu the Holy Man. So much so that he starts having visions of a god named the Great Hall. When you are worthy, then you will come to the two towers and be one with the Great Hall. That's a great effect, too, putting the camera at the end of 36-inch drainage tubing. It's very godlike. Anyway, the Great Hall tells Pardu he has to live the life of a holy man, and if he ever wants to cast the high-level magic spells, that means a vow of celibacy. Look, if you've, uh, if you've met somebody else or you uh, don't want to go out with me anymore, then that's fine, but just don't lie to me and, and, and say that you love me but you can't touch me. And I do love you. It is 
It's possible for me to love you without making love to you. Just like Lisa Marie Presley. Robbie even starts wearing his cleric robes all the time and eventually goes on his holy quest to the Two Towers to find the Great Hall. Only problem is he's nuttier than a payday bar and he doesn't really know where he's going. So once he gets to New York City, he gets completely lost. And it's here that I get a little bit confused as to the nature of Robbie's insanity. When he's at college, he's wearing his cleric robes, but when he goes to New York, he's wearing street clothes. But he still acts like Pardue when he's confronted by muggers and he tries to cast magic spells to ward them off. My spells, I guard them in my life. I mean, either he's crazy or he's not. He thinks he's casting spells and starts mistaking muggers for Gorevilles, but he paid for a taxi to take him to New York City. He had to plan this out, or at least hit an ATM machine. And when he stabs the mugger with his knife, he conveniently remembers what a payphone is long enough to put a silver piece in and call for help. Warning, the following clip will completely ruin your ability to enjoy any Tom Hanks movie you'll ever see again. Robbie? Okay, <laughs> hey, I'm in New York. New York? Robbie, are you all right? What happened? I don't know. I can't remember. Robbie, it's going to be all right. Where are you exactly? There's blood on my knife. Knife? What happened? It's on my hands. I think I killed somebody. I know I killed somebody. Robbie, just tell me where you are. Uh, That's not funny, guys. Man, I've been there. It's bullshit! I did not hit her! I did not! Hello? Ben, I need help! Oh, Spoonie! There's blood on my gun blade, Ben! I think I killed somebody! I know I killed somebody! Gun blade? Oh, you're playing Final Fantasy VIII again, aren't ya? I don't know! I can't remember! But Spoonie, how can you do this? You're tearing me apart, Spoonie! Robbie finds himself instinctively drawn to the subway system since it's the closest thing to a dungeon he can understand at this point, only far more dangerous with many, many more filthy, pea-smelling creatures, like this guy. I am Pardieu. I am a holy man. I'm the King of France. Your Majesty, I have been on a very long quest. Can you tell me of the giant dragon? On my travels here, I heard him. Dragon, you see? Yes, the giant dragon, so the one above. There he is. Okay, so he can't tell a subway train from a dragon. You know, there's a very real difference between crazy and stupid. Meanwhile, the group calls the police since Robbie's vanished and hasn't told anyone where he's gone to. Robbie a doper? No. Downers? No. No. Drink? Roofies, Quaaludes, Somas, the Hashish, and predictably, the detective latches on to mazes and monsters right away as the probable cause for his disappearance. What do you guys think happened? One of the players Robbie played with got carried away and killed him. Well, that's kind of far out. Mazes and monsters is a far out game. Swords, poison, spells, battles, maiming, killing. Hey, it's all imagination. Is it? You sick, deluded bastards. I don't know how you gamers sleep at night. Anyway, the group comes clean about their cave LARPing, and that brings us back to the beginning of the movie. He makes it pretty clear from the beginning that this is a body recovery mission, since he doubts a nerd like Robbie could possibly survive in a cave for over a week. You want to know the truth? We don't have idea one where Robbie Wheeling is, and I don't know if we ever will. The only thing I know is that if he's in those caverns, he's dead. Look, I don't want to fill you with any false hope. He probably fell down a crevice, shattered his pelvis, and was gnawed to death by cave rats. I mean, he might have survived, but I'd be blowing sunshine up your ass if I told you I thought that was true. Worst case scenario, he got bitten by a bat and turned into a blood-drinking man-bat creature. It's happened before. The group searches Robbie's room and finds a map to the two towers, which they figure out must mean he's gone on a pilgrimage to the World Trade Center. Which, I suppose, makes this movie the second worst thing to ever happen to the building. So they go there and, sure enough, find Robbie, who's headed to the roof so he can jump off. You're going to join the Great Hall. You can't. It's a trap. I have spells. I'm going to fly. 
You don't have enough points. I am the maze controller. This movie is bullshit! Clerics don't get the fly spell, that's clearly on the wizard spell list. I keep telling you, even a crazy role player would know these things. So they finally manage to talk him down and find Robbie a nice padded cell to sleep it off in for about three months. When they drive down to his house to check up on him, they find out that he's still in freaking Cooksville. Freelick! Aren't you dead? Didn't you die when you leaped into the pit? Hey, come on, Robbie, stop fooling around. It is you, Freelick, you have been restored to the living. Whoever did that is a great holy man. A greater holy man even than I. See, this is what happens when you let Scientologists treat the mentally ill. Oh, Glacia. Nimble, too. Perhaps you are preparing for yet another quest? Oh, Robbie. Glacia, has someone placed a spell of forgetfulness on you? I am Pardieu, the holy Robbie. man. Up his medication! I ran out of hats. This lake is enchanted, and beyond there you see the great forest. I feel there must be some evil force dwelling within it. If we could vanquish that evil, the innkeepers and his wife could live happily and in peace. Yes, uh, I am the maze controller. There is a, a kingdom of the evil Verations, ruled by the wicked Ak Oga. Within this forest lies terrible danger, but also a wondrous treasure. Shall ye enter? Aye. Oh, that's brilliant. Reinforces violent illusions, and it worked so well in Shutter Island. He thinks the neighbors across the lake are evil monsters. Before the week is out, we're going to find Robbie straddling their naked, flayed-open bodies while jerking off and shrieking the ballad of Bilbo Baggins. And so, we played the game again for one last time. It didn't matter that there were no maps, or dice, or no monsters. Um, yes! It fucking does matter! They're not real! This guy is insane! He stabbed people! I just don't get this movie. I mean, it even seems to make my argument for me, since it's clear that Robbie's problems run far deeper than a simple role-playing game. After all, if the game were the cause of all this madness, then the entire group would be a deranged murderous cult. But instead, we find the rest of the group are all doing quite well in school, have bright career prospects, and are part of a large, friendly social circle. We should all be so lucky. It just really bothers me that people try to find scapegoats and blame violence, murder, and insanity on completely unrelated things like works of fiction and violent video games. I mean, I play D&D, &D, I play violent video games, but that's not why I kill people. I kill people because it's the only way I can get an erection. Wait! Get up early when the sleeping pill wakes me I take a wake-up pill to fill with energy I power on hard and I check my messages But I don't have any messages I take a driving pill and head to my car I drive around the because work isn't very far I call my phone and I check my messages But I don't have any messages All I know is driving on drugs feels better when they're prescription All I know is the world looks beautiful The world looks so damn beautiful Fantastic, and I never felt as good as how I do right now. Except for maybe when I think about how I felt that day, when I felt the way that I do right now, right now. I feel fantastic, and I never felt as good as how I do right now. Except for maybe when I think about how I felt that day, when I felt the way that I do right now, right now, right now. Work is anything but quiet these days. I try to mitigate my concentration rates. I can see the day unfold in front of me So I take the stairs and hit the gym The phone is ringing when I get to my desk What was the sting? It's now a sharp pain in my chest So I take a call the next and just chill Freelick jumps into the pit to gather the treasure How much does Freelick get? It's a trap <laughs> 